evening all. Thanks for um, sharing your uh, Monday evening to listen to a talk, um, but hopefully it'll be useful for you. Um, and basically just wanted to go through electrophysiology um, with a focus on supraventricular tachycardia um, and sort of looking at the talk, just wanted to go through in terms of the overview of what we'll talk about, um, classification of SVT, how to sort of approach doing an EP study, just a brief bit about mechanisms of arrhythmia. It's pretty hard to understand any of electrophysiology if you don't understand entrainment. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, just go through a few cases and hopefully by the end of it, you know, this um, talk, you guys will sort of have a pretty good and basic understanding of AV node reentrant tachycardia, AV reentrant tachycardia and atrial flutter. And that's what I really wanted to focus on. I think it's quite hard for cardiology registrars, um, you know, even at hospitals where there is EP, um, to come and see the cases because uh, there's not really the, the basic concepts and principles aren't taught very much. And when you just come along to the lab, it's it's quite difficult to try and teach all of electrophysiology um, whilst also doing cases. So hopefully this will put you in good stead so you can come and join the cases and um, enjoy them a bit more. So look, in terms of um, differential diagnosis of tachycardia, you know, you all know this and um, tachycardia is, you know, differentiated either narrow or wide QRS tachycardia and it's either regular or irregular in nature. Um, and I guess we're mainly focusing on the um, regular QRS tachycardias and the main things we're really focused on are, you know, is, uh, you know, excluding sinus tachycardia, is it a focal atrial tachycardia or a reentrant atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter? Um, is it AV node reentrant tachycardia? Is it orthodromic AV reentrant tachycardia? Or, you know, unusual things like junctional tachycardia or a very high septal VT with a narrow QRS as possible? Um, and differentiating between those is really the main context of this talk today. Um, you've already got a pretty good idea just based on the age of the patient, um, what the, the diagnosis of the SVT might be with AV reentrant tachycardia, wolf parkinsons might obviously being more likely in the, the younger age group and AV node reentry becoming more likely as you get older and atrial tachycardia also sort of becoming more frequent in the older age groups. You all will have heard of short and long RP tachycardias and this will also give you a good idea as to which mechanism of tachycardia we're looking at. And if you can't see any P waves, it's most likely going to be AV node reentrant tachycardia, but it could be junctional tachycardia. Um, if it's a short RP tachycardia, so the R P interval is shorter than the P to R interval. It's again, most likely be AVNRT, but it could be atrial tachycardia and it could be orthodromic AV reentrant tachycardia. And if you've got a long RP interval, so the R P is longer than the P R interval, um, you know, this could be any of the, th the main three. So it could be an atrial tachycardia. It could be atypical AV node reentrant tachycardia, or it could be orthodromic AV reentrant tachycardia, but would require a slowly conducting accessory pathway. And this is a sort of flow chart, how to sort of approach, approach the, you know, SVT patient. So first of all, we've got our, you know, regular QRS tachycardia, narrow complex. If it's not regular, well, is it atrial fibrillation or atrial TAC with sort of variable block? Um, so that's led you off that way. But if it is regular, the question, first question is, are there P waves? If there aren't, well, you're straight down to the bottom and it's most likely going to be AVNRT, but it could also be, you know, the junctional tachycardia or a very unusual atrial tachycardia um, with a lot of AH delay um, causing the, the P wave to be sort of buried in the QRS. But if there are visible P waves, the next question is, is the atrial rate greater than the ventricular rate? Are there more A's than V's? If there's more A's than V's, it could be atrial tachycardia, focal. It could be atrial tachycardia reentrant, atrial flutter, or it could be AVNRT. So you can get AVNRT 
um, you know, with lower common pathway blocks. So you'll have, you know, two to one conduction from the A to the V. Um, the other question is, is the ventricular rate more than the atrial rate? And so if the, the, there's more Vs than As, well, obviously the key question is, is this VT? Um, but there's some unusual things that can cause this, um, you know, the junctional tachycardias, some of the very unusual accessory pathways like nodoventricular and nodofascicular pathways that don't involve the atrium can also have more Vs than As. So presuming you've got the same number of A's and V's, we then look at the RP interval. And if it's long RP, as we've said, it's gonna be atrial TAC, AV or ancient tachycardia or atypical AVNRT. And if it's a short RP, if it's very short and the RP is less than 70, it's pretty much always AVNRT. But if the RP is more than 70 millisecond, it could be any of the main players. So AVNRT, AV or ancient tachycardia or an ATAC or a junctional TAC. So this is really what we're talking about, approach to EP study. And I guess first up is just catheter positioning. So this is a standard LAO view. I've tried to sort of mimic where the tricuspid annulus would be in green and the mitral annulus in blue. And usually, you know, we usually do a two wire study, uh, at least where I work at Royal Melbourne St V's where um, we'll put diagnostic, there'll be two diagnostic catheters. So in the his location and the coronary sinus location, some centers will use a three wire study where there'll be an extra catheter in the right ventricle. And some places also use an extra catheter in the high right atrium. Um, the reason we don't use the extra catheter in the ventricle, um, at least at Royal Melbourne, is just a feeling that often these SVTs are in young patients with you know normal hearts we're often putting the patients on isoprelin as the consideration that you could perforate the RV just with a diagnostic catheter. And there's definitely case for reports of that. So then looking at the actual catheters, so take the coronary sinus catheter, there's 10 electrodes, we call it decapolar catheter, and the 10 electrodes make five, um, you know, bipolar pairs. And the distal pair is one, two, and the proximal pair is nine, 10. And this exact same is for the his catheter. So one, two is distal and three, four is proximal. So that's our normal setup. And in, in this case, we happen to also have an ablation catheter in, in place in the post receptal space. And this is sort of, you know, the typical fluoroscopic appearance of where you'd ablate AV and RT. So we've got the coolest technology of all the um, cardiology fields and um, we've got excellent 3D mapping technology and we can place our catheters um, in the heart without fluoroscopy. And so this is like an REO then tilted up and this is an LAO view over here. Um, and you can see the, the blue decapolar catheter going into the coronary sinus in the LAO view, and you can see it going off here uh, posteriorly. And the yellow catheter is marking out the his location. So I just need, need to spend a little bit of time just making sure that you guys understand basic um, interpretation of signals. And it just it's just a ECG with extended features that are actually really helpful to you. And so the general way that the trace will be set up is the top will be some ECG leads. And here we've got four ECG leads. Then we've got our His catheter that's marking out the AV node. Um, and then we usually put the, the coronary sinus catheter at the bo bottom with CX proximal at the, at the bottom and CS distal at the top. And so just first of all, it's just the, the his catheter is probably the most important one to understand. And this is at the AV node location. And there's sort of three distinct electrograms you can see here on the his catheter. So you've got an A signal, a sharp his spike, which is the electrical activity sort of running through the his bundle in the through the um, central fibrous body, and then a V signal on, on the his um, catheter as well. And here I've measured out the the HV interval and I put that 51 milliseconds, which is within normal limits. And so um, here's a different example um, of uh, the numbers have got a bit squashed over on the left-hand side of the screen. So I've put calipers on myself. So we've measured an AH interval here. It's 92 milliseconds. And this is actually the time, it, this is the time of conduction across the AV node. So the AV nodes within this AH interval. And so normal's 50 to 120, this is normal 92 milliseconds. This, if any number you're going to remember is the HV interval. 
and it should be more than 35 milliseconds. Um, and if it's short, would be suggestive that it could be, you could have a patient with, you know, pre-excitation. And that's, that'll be a common question you might get if you go to the EP lab, you know, got a patient who's having a WPW ablation. Oh, why is their HV interval short? Well, it's because they're pre-excited. And here's an example of that. And if you just look at the HIS catheter um, on HIS 560, you can see a a little H spike, then a V spike. And you might think if you just look at the HIS 560, you'd say, oh, no, that HV looks pretty normal. But you've actually got to measure it to the earliest V on all the leads. And you can see the surface ECG, this is 22 milliseconds. And I'll prove it to you and show you the 12 lead ECG. This is the start of the um, QRS here. So this is less than 35 milliseconds. And essentially, you know, the HV interval is short because you've got fusion. You've got fusion across the AV node as well as um, you know, simultaneous activation across an accessory pathway. The next thing that's a can be a little bit um, off-putting when you start looking at the um, intracardiac electrograms is differences in the coronary sinus lead. And so this is sitting, you know, obviously the coronary sinus and it's in the atrioventricular groove. So you can get both an atrial as well as a ventricular signal on it. So here on the left is a you know, really nice, clean, just atrial um, signal, CS prox to distal, very little far field ventricular sort of signal on it. Whereas if we look at the middle slide, you've actually got quite a sharp um, atrial signal as well, well as the far field ventricular signal is also quite sharp. And in the, on the right, you've got sort of very quite far field looking um, ventricular signals. So we usually start our EP study with a retrograde curve, um, assessing conduction from the ventricle back up to the atrium. And normal um, is what we call concentric um, the ventricular atrial conduction. So from, from, from the middle of the midline of the heart outwards. And so here we've got a patient, you can see at the bottom of the screen is the um, stimulus artifact. So we're pacing the ventricle at 500 milliseconds. And you can see we're pacing the ventricle ventricle because the QRS looks like it's right ventricular paced. It's left bundle. It might be up in the outflow track because it's a bit positive in lead two. And we put in one extra stimulus. So 500 millisecond drive train and then an extra. So an extra stimulus the last beat of the train is shorter than the rest of the train to stress the AV node. And we're looking at the conduction from the stimulus down um, to the proximal coronary sinus. And you can see this is going from CS proximal up to CS distal shown in the green line there. And if you look at this pictorially, um, just a schematic of the heart here, we've got our catheter in the right ventricle. Um, We've delivered a pacing spike with the little star. The conduction goes from this pacing site back up through the ventricular muscle Purkinje conduction system up to the AV node, retrograde through the AV node. That's why there's the delay. Then it gets part to the atrium and it's can the first thing it strikes is the midline CS prox out to CS distal. And that's that's the concentric activation. The next important normal thing about AV nodal conduction is that it decrements. So the AV node has features within it that will progressively prolong conduction the more you stress the AV node with shorter extra stimuli. So I've got the curve here. So what I want you to watch is this number here, the 275, keeping an eye on the stimulus to this CS proximal interval. And you'll see that it's gradually getting longer, the shorter and shorter we're introducing this extra stimulus. And it's getting so short, the extra stimulus is almost getting into where the beat before is reaching the atrium, but it's decrementing out, decrementing out, still decrementing out. You can see this A here is actually coming from that ventricular pace beat on the train our extra stimulus is going all the way out here until finally we don't actually reach ventriculo atrial 
nodal ERP, we've actually just reached ventricular effective refractory period. So the ventricle, it hasn't captured the ventricle at all here. But this is an example of normal concentric decremental VA conduction. And there's the yellow is where there should be the next um, ventricular captured beat that it hasn't actually captured because it's reached its refractory period at 190 milliseconds. So there are alternatives to retrograde conduction and, and the main one to just be aware of is eccentric VA conduction. So we said the normal is to go from CS prox to distal from the midline outward. And the eccentric is you know just the opposite, it's from the outside in. And you know, obviously this would happen if there's an accessory pathway on the lateral, left lateral position. So schematically, if we consider here, we introduced our pace beat. The conduction in this example is going through the Purkinje myocardial conduction system all the way through the lateral left ventricle. There's a pos, you know, presumed accessory pathway in the uh, lateral annulus. And then the first atrial activation is CFD to, to back towards the midline CSP. And then another alternative is that this might not be VA conduction. So not and that this is this can be a very normal finding, especially in young fit people. And sometimes you actually have to put people on isoprenaline to get um, conduction retrograde across the AV node. And so if you look at this, this it looks initially like quite a mess. And you go, what's what's happening here? There's so many sharp spikes everywhere. And this is where just understanding the coronary sinus examples that we were talking about before. And I've highlighted here, these are actually the atrial activation here I've highlighted in green, just marching along of its own accord, indifferent to the pacing rate that we're pacing the ventricle at 600 milliseconds. And the red sharp spikes are actually the ventricular signal on the coronary sinus lead um, and clearly dissociated from, from the atrial rhythm. So then the next thing we do is an antegrade curve. So looking at AV nodal conduction, pacing the atrium and uh, assessing back down to the ventricle. And so the critical thing we're interested in is the AH interval, which is the interval across the AV node. And so in this example, we've got like, uh, we're pacing, here's our pacing artifact here on CS prox. So we're pacing CS prox at a drive train of 600 milliseconds. We've introduced one extra stimulus at 340 milliseconds. As we said, the key thing to look at is the, the hiss, hiss lead. We can see a little hiss spike here. There's not much of an A on the hiss catheter. Ideally, you'd have like a hiss A and the, and the hiss signal and you'd measure you know, the actual AH interval. But sometimes if you don't have an A, you just have to measure the stimulus artifact to the H interval. And so what I want you to keep an eye on here as we're going to be progressively bringing down the extra stimulus shorter and shorter is this AH interval. And you'll see that that will decrement out. So 129, 143, and we're progressively, you can see shortening down to 320 milliseconds, down to 310 milliseconds, 300. So here we've actually started getting a little hiss A as well as a little hiss here. So that would be the actual interval if you had it all the time you'd measure, but you wanna have something that's consistent as well and you compare. So usually to be honest, we're usually gonna be measuring stimulus to the hiss rather than the actual hiss A interval, but it's still decrementing out, still decrementing out. And it's gotten so short with this last beat here and the signal's breaking up a little bit. And if you introduce extra stimuli too short, you can induce AF. So rather than just keeping on pushing on with the curve, we've actually introduced two extra stimuli. So we've put in one extra stimulus after a drive train of 600 at 320, and then an extra stimulus at 300. And we're now looking at this AH interval on the last, the second extra. So 136, 143, 152, 172. And this is we've now reached AV nodal ERP. So this is where the AV node could no longer conduct um, from the atrium to the ventricle. And it's actually, it's not from the atrium ventricle, it's the cross to the, across the AV node. We haven't even reached it. There's no hiss signal here, as you can see. And so this is, this is an example of 
normal decremental single AV node physiology. So that's normal. And we always go tens, 10 milliseconds shorter to make sure there's no gap physiology um, that we've missed. And so if we were to plot this on a curve, if you look at the A1, A2 interval, so that's the, this is, you can imagine that's the extra stimulus we're putting in at the end of our drivetrain, um, starting at 600, getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And the yellow dots are measuring the A2, H2 interval. And so it's usually pretty stable until you reach a point where it starts decrementing. And that's why we usually start our curve about with a 600 drivetrain and the extra at about 400, because you don't want to waste you know, five minutes going from 500 down to 400 if there's not going to be any decrement in the in the node. So we usually start at 600, 400. Progressively, you bring that extra down and down and down. The AH time, the time across the AV node, is progressing, get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit longer until it finally reaches its effective refractory period and can't conduct any further. And the H1, H2 interval is the Again, the, just the time of the hiss of the extra stimulus to the extra beat. And you can see the relative refractory period is where the H1, H2 starts to diverge off the line of unity to the A1, A2, getting long, it gets progressively gets longer and longer until it also reaches ERP. So once we've done the retrograde, retrograde curve, we then do a usually a Wenke back, which is just incrementally uh, reducing the atrial pacing rate, usually starting at 500, progressively bringing it down and down and down until you reach AV block. And you can see here, with this this is the end of the Wenke back sequence, 330 down to 300. And if you look at the QRS, it's the easiest way is where is there a missed QRS? It's just here. And if you were to look at the actual signals again, here's our hiss lead here. I've marked out the A. There, oh, there's the the, the hiss spike in yellow there. And if you were to look at the next beat along, you've got our A and then there's no hiss spike in the next beat. So that's that's the reason that you've, you've reached Wenke back there is blocking the AV node, not in the infrared hissian conduction system. Okay, so just a tiny bit on mechanisms of arrhythmia because it's just important to understand um, entrainment. Um, so you probably all know the main three mechanisms of arrhythmia are re-entry, abnormal automaticity, or triggered activity. Um, and it's basically about disorders of impulse formation, which is triggered activity or automaticity, or disorders of re-entry. And the main one I just want to talk about briefly is re-entry and the idea the critical requirements for re-entry are there has to be an area of union directional block. So that's sort of the circle in the, in the diagram here. And that can either be anatomical like scar, or it could be functional. It could be rate related block, um, such as at the cabotracuspid isthmus. Then you have to have an excitatory wave that's progressing along a distinct pathway returning to its point of origin progressively around and around the same path and interruption of this re-entrance circuit at any point along its path should terminate the circus movement. The other requirements are that the wavelength of the arrhythmia, so this is the, the black sort of shaded area from here to here, has to be shorter than the path length of that the circuit is looping around. And this distance is called the excitable gap. Um, and the larger the excitable gap, the easier it is to entrain an arrhythmia. So the wavelength of uh, a circuit is a, a function of the conduction velocity of the tissue and the refractory period of the tissue. And um, here, for instance, is an example of AV reentrant tachycardia with a zone of slow conduction through an accessory pathway um, and also through the AV node. So in terms of the principles of entrainment, there's three key ideas. And the first one is, and it's shown in the sort of top diagram, the yellow sort of um, bar is, you can imagine that's the, the re-entry looping around and around. The blue pacing stimulus is pacing, and we're trying to 
enter this arrhythmia. And the first principle of entrainment is this constant fusion at a constant pacing rate. So you can imagine if you have your arrhythmia going round and round the yellow bar and we're constantly inducing a pacing extra stimulus at exactly the same rate, the amount of fusion, which is the sort of blue arrows going out into the rest of the cardiac tissue is going to be the same every single beat. So there's constant fusion between your pacing stimulus and the SVT. But the last beat you deliver will loop around the circuit and will be entrained, but it will, but it will not be fused. So it'll be, it'll be identical to the SVT. The second concept is, and you can, this is in the second diagram, as you progressively increase the pacing rate, so this is here, and you can see here you've introduced the pacing stimulus earlier, so it's getting further into the circuit, there's more fusion, so more of these blue arrows are going out into the rest of the myocardium, causing more fusion between the pacing um, entrainment versus the actual SVT. And then the last principle of entrainment is that tachycardia termination is accompanied by block to a recording site. So this is a little R. If you have a little recording stimulus here, you're expecting to see always your um, activation coming from this direction towards point R. But with block of the circuit, you're going to get activation of this same site from a different direction. So either from here, because you block this tissue here, or the functional obstacle can now allow conduction through it and it's coming straight down towards it. So this is just taking you through a few um, entrainment examples. And this is really the critical maneuver in a lot of electrophysiology, um, which is why I'm laboring the point, sorry. And you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got a SVT, it's narrow complex. The VA relationship is one to one. And you can see here, we've delivered extra stimuli. You can see the extra stimuli are coming from the His catheter and we've got ventricular pacing, you know, QRS morphology. And so what we're looking at, looking at the intervals is the last V pace beat has entrained, it's reset, it's advanced the SVT circuit to the same rate in the atrium that you've paced in the ventricle. So 270 millisecond entrainment You've advanced this 290, 300 millisecond tachycardia to 270 milliseconds. So you've got a V, then an A, and the A goes back up to a V. So you've got a VAV response. And this is typical of AV node reentrant tachycardia or AV reentrant tachycardia. We'll come back to this slide a little bit later to tell you which of these two this is. This is an alternate example. So this is a V. So you've got a tachycardia here on the right hand side of the screen. Again, one to one conduction from A to V, CS prox to distal, the VA time, this is a long RP tachycardia. So this could be atrial tach, it could be atrial glavian RT, it could be an unusual AV reentrant tachycardia. So we've done our ventricular entrainment, we've paced faster. Our last pace beat has entrained, it's accelerated this last A, so V, A, and then you've got a second A and a V, so it's a V, A, A, V response. So this is diagnostic of atrial tachycardia, and it makes sense because you've got a tachycardia going along here, you've overdrive suppressed it by pacing from the ventricle, and you can see, even see the atrial activation is different when you pace the ventricle versus the tach, but the an atrial tachycardia coming from an isolated ectopic focus, it doesn't care about what, what you've done to entry, you know, advance the circuit. It's just going to keep firing off of its own, own accord. So that's why you get this VAAV response, and that's atrial tachycardia. There are a whole bunch of variants that make this a little bit difficult to interpret, though. This is the first one called the pseudo VAAV response. And so here you can see you're pacing the ventricle at 250 milliseconds at a, for a SVT with a cycle length of 270 to 290. So we usually try and train about 20 milliseconds quicker than the tachycardia cycle length. And so here we've got, it looks like a VAAV response, but if you look at the timing intervals, the last entrained beat is this one here. And so that V is actually going down to this A over here. Um, and the one before was coming from the previous um, pace beat. So this is actually not atrial tachycardia. This is more in keeping um, with 
you know, AV NRT or AV wrench and tachycardia. The next difference you could have is that you try and entrain from the ventricle. So here we've got a tachycardia at 440 milliseconds, again, one to one association from A to V. You've tried to entrain it for 10 and it just has not affected the circuit at all. Perhaps there's no VA conduction, but you have not trained this. So this is not actually, this is not a VAAV. It's not a pseudo VAAV. This is just not entrainment. But what you've shown is there's more A's than B's. This is almost definitely going to be atrial tachycardia, but not 100%. There's always exceptions. And it has exposed for you nicely the P wave so you can work out where your atrial tachycardia is coming from. So the next thing to just mention, which is quite critical in terms of differentiating of SBT in the EP lab is the response post entrainment, which is the post pacing interval um, minus the tachycardia cycle length and also looking at the stimulus to the A to the um, VA time in tachycardia. Um, so just looking at a few examples of this, this is the slides from the paper reference. This is AVNRT. So here we've got a tachycardia with a cycle length of 540 milliseconds. They've entrained this tachycardia and the post pacing interval, so the time from where you've entrained the tachycardia in the, the, the RV septum back to the return beat 690 milliseconds. So the post pacing interval 690 minus the tachycardia cycle length 540 is 150, which is long. And the other thing that we look at is the stimulus to the A in after pacing is 620 milliseconds minus the, the VA time in tachycardia of 500 is 120 is also long. Whereas in AV reentrant tachycardia, so we'll park in some wide orthodromic reentrant tachycardia, with our tachy cycle length of 470, when we entrain this, we've got a post pacing interval of 550 minus the 470 gives you a PPI TCL of 80, which is short. And looking at the STIM A 480 minus the VA of tachycardia 480 minus 440 is 40 is also short. And they sort of came up with these sort of uh, landmark slides that sort of differentiate our tachycardias. The main one we're really looking at is the post pacing interval minus the tachycardia cycle length. And if it's more than 115, it's more likely to be AVNRT. And if it's less, it's more likely to be orthodromic reentrant tachycardia. And for the STIM A minus the VA, the, the, the sort of cutoff is 85 milliseconds. And when we think about this schematically, I think the, the best thing to think about is um, why are these times long in AVNRT? So AVNRT is a circuit constrained, con constrained to the AV node and the perinodal atrium, sort of looping around and around and around and around in here. And if you entrain this circuit, you've got and from the RV apex, you've got to go into the Purkinje, you know, conduction system all the way back up the septal myocardium back through the AV node before you can even entrain the circuit. Then it's got to entrain it and then come all the way back before getting this return beat. And that's why the post pacing interval is so long. Whereas the alternative in AV reentrant tachycardia, you've got a circuit that's looping around involving the AV node, the Hispokinji system, the myocardium back through an accessory pathway. And where you're pacing from is actually part of the circuit. And so your last beat you entrain, the next beat that comes around, if you're truly on the part of the circuit, the PPI minus TCL should be zero. I mean, it's very rarely zero, but um, that, that's why it's shorter in AV range and tachycardia. But there are a lot of pitfalls. Um, you can sometimes get decrement in the AV node because you've, when you're in train, you're necessarily stressing the AV node more, which can put in delay in the AV node, um, which can then change the, all these times. And the, so there's a way of um, assessing a corrected post pacing interval minus tachycardia cycle length. And I'll show you that in the next slide or two. Um, the other issues are you may never be able to entrain the tachycardia. And that's one of the biggest problems, especially with atypical AVNRT. 
differentiation. Sometimes you can just never get into the circuit. You can never entrain it and it can make things quite confusing. Um, so here is, what have we got here? This is just an example of AV and RT. So this was the slide we used before um, with our VAV response. So the post pacing interval is 430 milliseconds from the entrain type back to here and tachycardia cycle length 290 milliseconds. So the PPI TCL is 140. That is greater than 115. So that's in keeping with AV and RT. And here we've got an example of uh, AV reentrant tachycardia via a uh, left lateral pathway. You can see that there's eccentric atrial activation. So we've been trained at 280. The post pacing interval is 394. The tachycardia cycle length is 284. So the PPI minus the TCL is 110 milliseconds, which is just under the cutoff. But if you look carefully, because you've stressed the AV node by coming in shorter with this entrainment run, I've got the A on the His catheter in green and the H in yellow. The AH interval is longer um, with your entrainment run versus during tachycardia. So we could subtract off the 110, the decrement in the AV node, which is 143 minus 121, which ends up giving a corrected PPI minus TCL of 88, which is again short, but you've just proved the principle and it's a nice teaching point. So this then is how we differentiate most tachycardias. So first of all, if you look at this, the septal VA interval, so the time from the QRS to the proximal coronary sinus A, if it's less than 70 and you've got a VAV response, it's going to be typical AVRT. If you've got a VAAV response, they put H here for technically it's a VAAHV. Um, so if you've got a VAAV response, it's atrial tachycardia. Now, if your septal VA is more than 70 and you've got a VAAV response, it's atrial tach. If you've got a VAAV response, um, you then can look at the PPI minus TCL and the stim A minus VA to work out is this AV wrench and tachycardia or atypical AVNRT. So then just coming to an EP tracing, it's always best to sort of focus on zones of transition, be it where there's a period of AV block, onset of tachycardia, offset of tachycardia. Always just start at the top of the trace, look at the surface ECGs, go through the electrograms from top to bottom, look at the AV relationship, look at the atrial activation sequence, look at the ventricular activation sequence from what you can see, have a look at the hist deflection and the relationship of the hist to the A and V, the HV and VA intervals, formulate a hypothesis and do some maneuvers to challenge that. And in general, what we're going to do during our EP study is first of all, just look at our baseline observations, do some simple maneuvers during sinus rhythm and overdrive pacing, our retrograde and antegrade curves, have a look for spontaneous observations during tachycardia and then perform some maneuvers during tachycardia. So, Baseline observation. So the main thing you want to look at was the HV interval. Is there pre-excitation? Um, doing the you know antegrade curve. Is there dual AV node physiology? You know if you pace from CS distal instead of CS proximal, do you get different degrees of pre-excitation? Pacing closer to a pathway will increase the degree of pre-excitation. During the ventricular retrograde curve, you know what's the activation sequence, is it concentric or eccentric? And so just for example, you know, here's, an e here's a retrograde curve um, and there's lots of information to be gleaned from this. I mean, you can see there's V pacing 500 milliseconds. Uh, QRS on the surface CCG looks like you're pacing the right ventricle. There's an extra stimulus at 420. The atrial activation sequence is eccentric. It's going from CS distal to CS proximal. There doesn't seem to be much delay 
comparing the drivetrain versus the extra stimulus, which is typical of accessory pathways. When you stop pacing, you've got sinus rhythm and you can see that there's pre-excitation. So this is already, you've seen this one slide and gone, okay, well, this person's got, you know, a, a left, left lateral accessory pathway that's non-decremental. And so you're already, even with the first maneuver, you're already thinking about what the, what the likely diagnosis is. The other thing, if you look really carefully, perhaps we don't really have it, but on this first beat on the screen, the CS activation is different here. It looks a bit CS prox to distal. Maybe, maybe, I mean, you'd want to, I'd want to know some more information, but perhaps have they reached the AV, the VA uh, nodal effective refractory period here just above 500, which is why this has gone from CS prox to distal over the AV node versus predominantly over this accessory pathway, CS distal to proximal. So spontaneous observations, you know, these are the sort of key things we're looking at, the VA relationship, the VA interval, atrial activation sequence, the way it terminates, what changes in the his to his interval do to changes in the A to A interval and what changes in bundle branch block do. And sort of going through these, you know, quickly, um, if the, the VA relationship is the same, it could be any of the three main players, AVNRT, AVNRT, and Tachycardia or ATAC. If there's more V's than A's, um, it could be the, you know, the very rare nodo-fascicular, nodo-ventricular reentrant tachycardia, or it could be a very unusual AV node reentrant tachycardia. If there's more A's than V's, it could be AV node reentrant tachycardia with, you know, lower common pathway block or atrial tach. Um, if the VA interval is very, if it's longer than 70, uh, it could be atypical AVNRT, avian tachycardia or ATAC. If it's less than 70, it's usually going to be uh, typical AVNRT. Um, we've already sort of discussed about the atrial activation sequence. If it's concentric, it could be anything. If it's eccentric, it could be um, atrial TAC or AV reentrant tachycardia involving um, a, a pathway. And if the tachycardia spontane always terminates um, with an A, it makes atrial tachycardia very unlikely if it's repeatedly happens. Um, and if bundle branch block causes a more than 30 millisecond increase in the VA time, it makes a free wall pathway more likely. Um, this is from the, the Europace sort of um, document on techniques for differentiation. I guess you've got ventriculum pacing things you can do in maneuvers in sinus rhythm or in tachycardia and atrial pacing you can do in sinus rhythm or tachycardia. And we're really just going to focus on a couple of things. We've already spoken about overdrive pacing and our um, response post pacing and the post pacing interval and tachycardia cycle length. Um, the other thing I th we should talk about and I'll show you an example of is putting in his synchronous extra stimuli and we'll also talk about atrial entrainment. So, just the first, we just want to go through the main three tachycardias, AVNRT, AVRT, and atrial flutter, and just make sure you understand these. So AVNRT, the main thing to understand is dual AV node physiology. These are some ECGs. You've all seen dozens of, of these. This is the classical RSR prime in lead V1, with this being the retrograde fast pathway conduction. You can sometimes see an S prime which is the same thing in the inferior leads. And this is atypical APNRT, a long RP tachycardia um, with a superiorly directed P wave axis. And so dual AV node physiology, um, sort of, this is one of the first papers discussing this. And if we look at this conceptually, if you've got a pacing extra stimulus at a constant rate, usually it's going from the pacing stimulus down to the AV node, delay as you go across the AV node, and then down to the ventricle, and quite fast conduction across the AV node down to the ventricle. So that's normal. Then you're pacing the same rate, but then you put in an early extra stimulus. So you put in an early extra stimulus, it's blocked the fast pathway here, so it can't conduct there. But the extra stimulus can conduct through this slowly conducting um, circuit over here, 
the slow pathway and much longer conduction across the AV node than down to the ventricle. Then if you put in a critically timed extra stimulus, it might block in the node, go down the slow pathway, get to a turnaround point in the AV node, go down to the ventricle at the same time as it comes back up the fast pathway if there's been enough time whilst you conduct through the slow pathway for the fast pathway to have recovered refractoriness, so to become excitable again. So that's what we call um, a typical echo. So down the slow, retrograde back up the fast. And if you have specifically timed extra stimulus with you know, specific conditions, you can induce tachycardia. So you get block in your fast pathway, down the slow pathway, back up the retrograde fast pathway until, and it will loop around and around and around. Since that's the critical um, concept of AVNRT is the dual AV node physiology. And it might, in about 10 to 20% of the population have dual AV node physiology, but not everyone has the particular physiological characteristics and burden of activity that will sort of induce tachycardia. And so if you were to look at this pictorially, we'll just focus on the a2, H2 time. So this is the time across the AV node. So as we said, you get to about 400 milliseconds and the time across the AV node is pretty stable, but then it starts decrementing. The AH time gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And then suddenly there's a, with a 10 millisecond decrement in your extra stimulus, you get a huge increase um, in your AH time. And this, that's the AH jump with the number that we use being a 10 millisecond decrease in the extra stimulus should cause a fifth, more than 50 millisecond increase in the AH interval. And that's our criterion for dual AV node physiology. Um, and these are just the, the ECGs and the um, diagrams that we, we showed before. And so this is a case example. So we've got our pacing cycle length here and we're pacing from CS prox. We've got surface ECG, his catheter, you can see the AHV interval here and we're putting in an extra stimulus at 330 milliseconds and I've measured out the AH time for you. So we've gone from an extra stimulus of 330 to 320 and our AH time has gone from 119 to 294 so that's very clearly more than 50 milliseconds for a 10 millisecond decrease in extra stimulus. And as well as the AH jump, you've also got the typical echo. So you can see on the first slide, there's no atrial activity here on the coronary sinus catheter, but after the jump, that's, this is the retrograde conduction through the fast pathway activating the atrium again. And if it's critically timed, it's induced the echo and tachycardia and the VA time, which is from the start of the V down to the A is less than 70 milliseconds. It's effectively zero. And um, if you see this, it's nearly always going to be AVNRT, but it could be atrial tachycardia with very long conduction from the A to the H if there were certain um, characteristics, but it would be very rare to see that. Um, so what we usually do is introduce an atrial extra stimulus during tachycardia. So tachycardia is going long. You can very clearly see the pacing stimulus with pace CS prox, you can see this next atrial activation is clearly being brought in. The question is, has it affected the tachycardia at all? And so measuring two A to A intervals beforehand and around this beat, it's completely has not affected the tachycardia at all. Um, and that's because the AVNRT it's a circuit that's mostly constrained to the AV node and a small amount of perinodal atrium, but mostly the atrium's not even part of the SVT circuit. Um, so pacing from CS prox is it's distant to the circuit. It hasn't affected it at all and, it, and won't affect the ar arrhythmia. Whereas if you had atrial tachycardia, you would expect to get some change in the subsequent A and also in the subsequent VA relationship. Um, this is our entrainment of AVNRT, and it's the same example we used before with the long PPI TCL, so 430 minus 290. That's it, and a BAV, so it's all in keeping with AVNRT that we've spoken about. Um, if you want to be thorough, you could put in a his synchronous PVC and make sure you don't have a 
unexpected uh, nodo for ventricular uh, nodo fascicular pathway um, and you've introduced your your ventricular exostimulus when the his bundles already committed you can see the QRS morphology has changed because you've paced the ventricle and you've done absolutely nothing to the subsequent A and you've done nothing to the subsequent timing of the next expected V and that's again uh, because the ventricle is not part of the AVNRT circuit. So how do we fix AVNRT? So we usually ablate in the slow pathway region shown in green just anterior to the coronary sinus os and the typical response when you heat up the the junctional atrium is to get junctional speeding so this is during a burn you can see the um, atrial activation in blue um, we've got our hiss signal down here in red and you can see these junctional beats so the a and v coming on time um, during ablation that gradually wanes away and so this is an example of a case you know, just doing AVNRT ablation. And so usually we, we try and get a little small A with a big V on the ablation catheter in this slow pathway region. And when you're actually got your foot on the pedal, all, all we're really looking at is the association of the A on the coronary sinus lead. And we, I usually put a surface lead ECG down the bottom and all I'm looking at is this AV relationship. And if there's ever any V without an A or A without a V, you have to come uh, immediately off so you don't get heart block. And this is now playing in real time. And so I'll just got, I'll stop it in two seconds. So, oh, I didn't just stop the thing altogether. So I'll just um, call out the J's when they happen. So there's a J there, J, 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 sinus J, 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 sinus J, J. And so, all we're doing is just looking at this AV relationship. We're watching this junctional speed in intermittently happening. We'll stay on for 30 to 60 seconds, looking at the rate of this junctional speeding when it does occur, always trying to keep it over 400 milliseconds. And then once we've done our burn, reassess nodal conduction and see if the slow pathway uh, conduction is still present or not. And so this is pretty, it's probably the most stressful part of EP is doing AVNRT ablation because it can really be pretty close to the AV node. This is a sort of three dimensional mapping sort of system uh, with each of these balls being three, three millimeter ablation lesions. The his catheter is in yellow um, in the RO LAO view. And this is, you know, about a centimeter away from the AV node. And that's, you know, there's been studies showing that the, the usual distance of uh, successful ablation of AVNRT to the, to the AV node is about 14 millimeters. This is a fluoroscopic LAO representation. So, um, you know, this is a stressful procedure and really have to be very um, focused when you're doing this. So it might be not the best time to ask questions while, while someone's pushing on the pedal. Um, this is an example of atypical AVNRT. You can see here is onset of tachycardia. There's pacing from the coronary sinus. There's an extra st stimulus, tachycardia onset. This is different from the other tachycardia. The VA time is longer. It's not definitely not, you know, less than 70. It's definitely not zero either. Um, but it's one to one. Um, there's varying VA times, which you can see in atypical AVNRT, but you can also see in atrial tachycardia. So we've got an undifferentiated tachycardia. But we've got a pseudo VAAV response. But it's really, it's a VAV response, and it's more in keeping with um, with AVNRT rather than atrial tachycardia. And we put in an early A during tachycardia and it's terminated the circuit. And it could terminate atrial tachycardia, but if it occurs repeatedly, it's probably more consistent with AVNRT because what you're doing is you're delivering an early extra stimulus during tachycardia. I've just drawn arrows in and conducts down to the ventricle but you're concealing back into the slow pathway when you put in this extra stimulus, which has actually made the slow pathway refractory to being uh, excited again to carry on the, the, the circle. Um, this is ablation during atypical APNRT and all we're doing when we're doing this ablation. So most 
ABNRT, you're going to latent sinus rhythm, just looking at your junctional speeding, looking at the AV relationship. Atypical ABNRT, um, you can ablate during tachycardia, this is an example, and all you want to keep an eye on is the AV relationship, making sure there's no block in the, in the anti-grade nodal direction. If there is, you have to come again immediately off. Um, and this is a patient I actually mapped the exit of, you know, during AVNRT and put a multipolar catheter on the septum. And really it's just showing that this is where the slow pathway exits with conduction down the fast pathway. This is where it comes back out through um, the slow pathway and it tells you, can be, can be a guide as to where, you, where to ablate um, atypical AVNRT. So just moving on to AV reentrant tachycardia. Um, you'd all be familiar with this. This is pre-excited atrial fibrillation, um, variable R to R intervals, varying QRS morphology. Um, if you were to look at it, you'd say, oh, this looks like an accessory pathway, um, left-sided, because the QRS is positive in V1. And when they're back in sinus rhythm, you can clearly show um, sinus rhythm with a delta wave. The delta is positive in V1, it's positive in lead two. So it's a left-sided pathway. If two, three and ADF are all positive, it's anterior. If they're all negative, it's posterior. This is sort of neutral. So it's sort of left midline um, accessory pathway. Um, this is like a slide I had from some years ago, which is, um, what you don't want to do if you have someone with pre-excited atrial fibrillation, which is give intravenous metoprolol 10 milligrams, because all you're doing is blocking the node and encouraging the AF to go straight over an accessory pathway and cause VF, um, which is exactly what's happened here. Um, and then the patient will have to get shocked. Um, so here's an example of um, AV reentrant tachycardia. Um, surface ECG, his leads, CS signals, you can see there's one-to-one -one conduction from the V to the A. The atrial activation sequence is eccentric. It's first in CS distal down to CS proximal. And if we were to look at this schematically, the circuit's going over the AV node, probably over the left bundle, and then coming back through the left-sided accessory pathway. The first part of the atrium it encounters is the CS distal, which is why the activation is distal to prox. This is the same patient and you can see now rather than our narrow QRS we've got a wide QRS tachycardia that's matching the pre-excited maximally pre-excited beat and this is antidromic AV reentrant tachycardia and so this time the circuit's going antigrade over the bypass tract coming back retrograde through the AV node looping round and round the first part of the atrium to be activated after it exits the AV node is CS prox, which is why the atrial activation sequence is the reverse of the previous slide. And effective bundle branch block is um, important. So you can imagine a left lateral accessory pathway. It's got, it'll take the shortest circuit. So it'll involve some portion of the left bundle looping round and round. But if you get left bundle branch block, it then has to conduct over the right bundle. There has to be transept or conduction and all that delay will make the tacky cycle length longer, but more importantly, it will make the VA time longer with a bundle branch block if it's on the ipsilateral side as the pathway. Um, and this is an example um, looking at a tachycardia going from a relatively narrow QRS incomplete right bundle 85 millisecond VA time out to 163 milliseconds with a left bundle branch block and that's consistent um, with a left-sided accessory pathway. You might say oh but the atrial activation sequence doesn't really look that eccentric it's sort of earliest in CS5-6, but what we actually do when we have these pathways is we push that coronary sinus catheter right around until it's part of it's actually sort of coming over the anterior part of the annulus because we want to bracket the earliest atrial activation site to give us an idea about where we need to ablate the, the accessory pathway. Um, so this is a, another manoeuvre, if you come to the lab, you'll see us do when we think there might be an accessory pathway, which is a his synchronous 
PVC, called the Zipes Manoeuvre by some. Um, and so what we're doing, just to take you through the sequence, we've got our tachycardia, um, it's right bundle branch block aberration, um, CS activation, it's relative CS prox to distal. Um, and I've marked out our little hiss spikes here in yellow. And the H to H time before our extra stimulus is 266 milliseconds. And so our extra stim our PVC has come exactly where you'd want the hiss signal to be. And so we're aiming to be, you know, 20 to 50 milliseconds prior to the to the hiss deflection because basically what you want to do is you want to deliver this ventricular extra stimulus once the AV node is already committed. And then we're looking at what is the A to A time after the extra stimulus. So it's shorter 249 versus the, the tachycardia of 261. So you've brought in the next day. So you've proved there's an accessory pathway there, which is good, but you haven't proved that it's participating in the circuit, what you need to do is also prove that you've pulled in the next V as well. So here, two V to Vs is 530, and around this extra stimulus, you've pulled in the subsequent V by 13 milliseconds. So this is an accessory pathway uh, that's participating in the circuit. Um, this is the even more um, characteristic of accessory pathway or diagnostic of an accessory pathway participating in the circuit wherein a his synchronous PVC actually terminates the tachycardia and it's terminated the tachycardia by causing block in the accessory pathway. It couldn't come back through the um, accessory pathway, so you, which you can see. Um, so as we said, um, if the his refractory uh, PVC um, terminates the tachycardia or delays the next atrial activation, a bypass tract is present and participates in the circuit. If it advances the next atrial activation, it's, a bypass tract is present and it probably participates in the circuit, but you also want to prove that it advances the next ventricular activation also. So here's an example where you've clearly introduced the PVC, the QRS has changed, but I've given you the atrial intervals you haven't um, changed the interval at all but you've delivered the his pvc after the after the his synchronous you want to be on time or before so it's not not early enough and the other thing is you're delivering a pacing an extra beat from the right ventricle when you've clearly got a left-sided accessory pathway so not all left-sided accessory pathways are going to be reset and advance with a with the catheters introducing PVCs from the right ventricle. Um, so here's an example of a patient retrograde curve, eccentric atri atrial activation. And now we're actually focusing on, you know, how do we ablate these pathways? And so the first thing to look at is just the signal on the ablator. So we ablate these on the annulus. So you want a balanced ANV signal and you want, the first way to map them is mapping them antigrade. So mapping the earliest V on the local ablation catheter on the annulus to the delta wave. So we've, what we're actually doing is we're sort of hunting around is measuring the time from the start of the delta wave to this earliest local V, working out where the earliest site is, where the most fused AV annular signal is and this is where we found this for this patient. This line here is the onset of ablation. We're ablating, we're ablating, we're ablating, we're ablating and you can see the QRS morphology goes from pre-excited to non-pre-excited because you've got block in the accessory pathway from the ablation and then when you test the retrograde conduction after ablation there's actually no VA conduction, but there's definitely not the eccentric atrial activation you previously saw. And sometimes you'll see after you do um, ablation of an accessory pathway and you do repeat your testing, you might find that the patient has dual AV node physiology because often it's the, you need critical delay to allow the circuit to uh, enable re-entry and having dual AV node Physiology, if you're conducting over a slow pathway, gives you a longer path cycle length 
um, which makes the tachycardia more easy to re-enter. And we have you most accessory pathway ablations, at least I do, usually using three-dimensional electroanatomical mapping, which is useful because sometimes you'll ablate the pathway or you might bump it and it goes away and the, the mapping system gives you a, a tag for where, where you were and where you need to be um, to consolidate your ablation lesions. Um, the alternative way, um, and sometimes you can only do that, um, is, is mapping the pathway retrograde. So you're pacing the ventricle and you're trying to map the earliest atrial signal. Again, you're on the annulus and you're looking for a, a balanced VA signal and you want a fused signal. And so that's we've got a nice sharp V, nice sharp A, um, quite fused. And we've come onto ablation just at the line here, RF on, and as we come along, we can see after five beats, our VA has popped out. So we've blocked the accessory pathway. And you can also see the eccentric conduction across the pathway has gone back to a concentric pattern, which is because you're now conducting over the AV node. So this is, for instance, how you'd have to ablate a concealed accessory pathway. Um, and again, accessory pathway ablations can be stressful and the most stressful is when they're in this sort of septal location. This yellow ball is where the, the hiss, hiss signal is identified. These are sort of three millimeter balls again. This is where we've ablated this pathway. Um, and you can see a balanced AV signal here. Um, and the critical point when you have these accessory pathways in this septal region is to make sure there's not a hiss signal in sinus rhythm when you when you block when you block the accessory pathway and there's maneuvers that you can do to block the accessory pathway before you ablate uh, to work out is is there an actually a, a hiss signal underlying this this region so just lastly, just to talk about atrial flutters. Um, so obviously, you know, counterclockwise or clockwise, and you're nine times more likely to have counterclockwise flutter, uh, which is, you know, negative in the inferior leads, positive in V1, and, eight, and clockwise atrial flutter is the opposite. And it can sometimes look really irregular clockwise atrial flutter, and you can wonder if it's AF, but um, if, you, if you look at it carefully, you'll see um, the atrial activation. Um, this is, you know, the old school setup of atrial flutter um, where you'll have your coronary sinus lead. I'd always have a hiss lead in, which we haven't got in here. And previously, um, people used to put in a, this halo catheter that would sort of go around the tricuspid annulus and you'd put your ablation catheter down uh, on the tricuspid annulus and basically the ablation set is from the tricuspid annulus back to the inferior vena cava to cause a line of block across the, um, the isthmus there. Um, these are the sort of EP signals um, from an atrial flutter case and you can see surface ECG, hiss, coronary sinus and our halo catheter. Um, you can see there's more A's to V, there's activation CS prox to distal and the activation sequence on this halo catheter is from the distal uh, pole back towards the proximal pole. And when we look at that on the fluoroscopically, you can see that's counterclockwise activation around the tricuspid annulus. And so what we like to do um, with atrial flutters and atrial tachycardias is to atrially entrain the circuit. So again, pacing 20 milliseconds um, quicker than the tachycardia cycle length. And we're again looking at the post pacing interval um, from where we've entrained. So here we've entrained from CS prox, this atrial flutter um, and the post pacing interval. So the return interval from where you've paced to the next atrial beat, 345 milliseconds with a tack cycle length of three, two, four, so 21 milliseconds. And if it's less than 30, we generally say that's in the circuit. So CS prox is in, which is what you expect with typical flutter. And so we then generally entrain CS distal. And you can see that the post-pacing interval is long, four, two, three. 
uh, minus 325, so 98 millisecond, which is clearly out, which is again what you expect for typical flutter. And then if you actually put an ablation catheter on the cavotrocuspid isthmus, you've actually got perfect entrainment, um, which is you know exactly what you'd expect if you're entraining from a critical part of the circuit, and this is the last entrain beat here. You, previously, you could you know also entrain from your halo catheter, which is what's been done from um, you know halo pole one two, and again the post pacing interval two five three milliseconds is the same as the tack cycle length um, again from your because you're entraining from within the actual circuit and. During ablation, um, this is termination of tachycardia, and they must be on the IVC end of the cavotracuspidismus line because there's no signal on ablation prox. Um, and this is usually where you're going to, to terminate these atrial flutters, and also where you usually get CTI line block. And then, so once we've done the CTI line, we want to prove that it's blocked. And so we do a few simple pacing maneuvers. So the first thing we do is pace from um, CS proximal, and then we have a catheter just on the other side of the CTI line, be it the halo catheter, or you can just put the ablation catheter there, uh, which is 160 milliseconds. And it's so long, I mean, because you paste from here, it's got to go all the way around to get back to this point over here rather than straight through that area. It should be very short in the order of, you know, less than 100 milliseconds. And then we paste the other way. And again, it's got to go all the way around the annulus to get back to CS prox. And the other thing you can see is the HIS A is before the CSP, because HIS A would probably it'd probably be somewhere up here. So it's going all the way around the annulus back to HIS A to CSP. Um, so that's what we call bidirectional CTI line block. And this is a sort of 3D representation of this in sort of RAO and LAO. The different colours are just different force time contact um parameters so the red red's higher and the greens lower which is usually what we're doing because you usually use lower ends on the ivc end of the line because it's you don't want to perforate the ivc um, and we've actually put in the numbers here so these white dots are where we've gone and checked for um cti line block at the end of the procedure unfortunately the 160 something number is hidden underneath this ablation lesion but the numbers longer pacing from here versus pacing from a more lateral point. The CS is over here, so which is exactly what you want. So pacing from a more lateral point has got to go all the way around the analyst back to CS prox, whereas if you're even closer to the line, it's further away because it's got to go all the way back to this point before it can come around back to CS prox. So look, we've covered quite a lot. Um, and just to summarize, uh, we haven't even really spoken too much about focal atrial tachycardia, but it's usually an automatic or triggered arrhythmia. Uh, could be focal micro reentry, but that's unlikely. Um, atrial rate 130 to 250, high ablation success, typical atrial flutter, um, reentrant atrial tachycardia or macro reentry. You know, the atrial rate is usually 250 to 350, again, a high ablation success rate, ADNRT. The requirement is really just the AV node and perinodal atrium. Um, it's a reentrant mechanism. Um, it's probably the most common SVT, again, a high ablation success rate. AV reentrant tachycardia involves, requires both the atrium, the AV node, and the ventricle, unless you've got an unusual um, reentrant tachycardia like nodoficicular or nodoventricular reentry. And um, Again, high success rate, a delta wave affects about one in a thousand in the population. And we haven't um, had time to speak about um, atrial fibrillation. Um, so look, in summary, I think we've gone through quite a lot, including you know, classification of SVT, mechanisms of arrhythmia and what entrainment involves, um, how to approach an EP study, which is basically a few simple maneuvers in sinus rhythm, observe the tachycardia, perform some maneuvers during tachycardia, and, and we've gone through examples of AV node reentrant tachycardia to understand dual AV node physiology.
AV wrench and tachycardia and also atrial flutter and 